So, ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon. My name is John Cochlin. I'm, I'm a parent, or as it says on my badge, a non-professional. Um, <laughs> very pleased to be with you here today. My, my other uh, function here is I'm the chair of the International Cerebral Palsy Society, uh, which is a very grand name, but it's a very small organization. We do have members all around the world, um, but, uh, but it, centrally we are just a, a small group of volunteers. Um, it's my uh, pleasure and honor to present Dr. Sue Fletcher Watson, who is a senior research fellow and director of the Salveson Mindroom Center for Research into Learning Difficulties at the University of Edinburgh. She studied psychology and became interested in development disabilities, in particular autism, through voluntary work. She is the founder of Super Troop, a charity providing residential holidays for children and young people with learning disabilities. And she's going to be talking to us this afternoon about merging psychological theory with neurodiversity, with a new neurodiversity framework for better autism interventions. Thank you. Thank you. It's a very great honor to be here. I haven't been to EACD since it was in Newcastle, um, so it's really exciting to be back. Um, I'm going to be also talking about participation, but in a slightly different way than in the previous talk, because what I'm talking about is um, autistic people participating in the research process. Um, and while I'm talking about autism, because that's where my experience has been, I hope that you'll find it relevant to a range of other um, populations that you might be working with. So the outline of the talk is that I'm just going to say a little bit about what neurodiversity is or the way, one of the ways that we could define it, why it matters in a research context and how we might integrate the concept of neurodiversity in the research that we're doing. I'll then elaborate on that by talking a little bit more about principles of participatory working. So that's working in partnership with stakeholders outside of academia and clinical practice. Um, and I'll give some specific examples of how neurodiversity framework can be applied to intervention because I think one of the misunderstandings about neurodiversity that's very prevalent is that uh, proponents of neurodiversity are arguing that uh, specifically autistic people or neurodivergent people in general don't need any help or support and they just need to be accepted and left to themselves. Now, of course, neurodivergent people need to be accepted and if they wish, left to themselves. But actually, the neurodiversity movement is not arguing that, uh, that there is no such thing as disability and that autism cannot be a disability. Uh, it's really focusing the cause of that disability in a slightly different location than it has been historically and arguing for us to slightly shift our framework. Um, just a quick note on language. So in the UK at the moment, there's a very heated debate about the language that we use to talk about autism. In this case, I'm going to be using identity first language in the presentation. And that's because the work that I'm reporting on here was all done with autistic people who themselves prefer to use identity first language. And so that's to respect their choice. But there are people I work with sometimes who prefer person first language, and I do use that on occasion as well. Okay, so, um, oh, yes, you can, you can vote while I'm talking. So I think, I forgot about that. Um, so I think you can do it three times. I think there'd be, there's one at the beginning, and then there's one in the middle, and there's one at the end. And I'm wondering if you will shift from being curious or confused into being more confident and excited at the end. Cross fingers. Um, but if you're still just confused at the end, then you can come and talk to me in the break. Okay, so what is neurodiversity? So um, neurodiversity takes two words that you're familiar with, the idea uh, of a brain-based um, uh, construct uh, and the concept of diversity. So neurodiversity is just saying that lots of people have different kinds of brains. Um, and these different kinds of brains make us uh, take in information, uh, process it, and respond to it in different kinds of ways. Um, so there are many, many neurodivergent human beings in the world. Um, neurodivergent people, uh, so there's, you know, we're all different, right, of course, but neurodivergent people would be used to describe people who are in some way categorically different from the kind of neurotypical uh, majority. 
And autistic people are all neurodivergent, but not all neurodivergent people are autistic. So neurodivergent is a, is a larger category than autism, and it includes other things, including maybe ADHD, dyslexia, DCD, etc. Crucially, neurodiversity emphasizes that these brain-based differences are naturally occurring. And the concept is, has been really promoted and led by neurodivergent people. And so for that reason, neurodiversity is associated with disability rights, with the social or post-social model of disability. And there has been a lot of um, autistic people leading this. So it is often associated with autism in particular. Crucially, as I've said, neurodiversity doesn't mean that we're denying the existence of disability or the support needs that people have. It also doesn't mean that we're focusing just on what um, uh, ad, uh, adults who advocate for themselves are telling us about their experience. It, it's not a movement that excludes children and young people or people with learning disabilities or people with barriers to communication that make it hard for them to self-advocate. It doesn't mean that we're excluding the point of view of parents. And of course, lots of autistic people are parents. Um, it doesn't mean from a scientific point of view that by incorporating this kind of socio-political framework, we're introducing some sort of bias into our research. Just as um, acknowledging the, the existence of sexism doesn't inherently bias studies of, of gender. Um, it doesn't mean when I'm talking about stakeholder partners, I'll often be referring to people who are outside of academia. Um, but I'm not forgetting the fact that there are many autistic researchers, both working in the autism field, um, but also working in lots of other fields, of course. And as I've said, it doesn't mean that, that by taking on board this kind of um, sociopolitical perspective, we're forgetting about what constitutes robust science. So why should we care about neurodiversity? Well, I think um, thinking about neurodiversity is part of a broader equality and diversity agenda that we're all considering in all walks of life. Um, we know, of course, that um, neurodivergent people have been subject historically to terrible abuses. In fact, just this week in the UK, an absolutely horrific um, abusive uh, organization has been uncovered in, in part of the UK. And I'm really kind of appalled that my country that has no excuse for this kind of thing um, ha, is still allowing that kind of service to be provided. Um, so these abuses are not merely historic, sadly. Um, we're living in a time as researchers where there are more and more autistic scholars and community leaders who can support our research. And, and when I say autistic, of course, that's in relation to my research. So neurodivergent scholars of all kinds. Um, and by working with these um, articulate and um, well-educated individuals, we can gain really profound and amazing insights into populations who may be very much harder to work with directly or to, to understand directly. So a good example of that would be the insights I now have into what we call restricted and repetitive behaviors, one of the domains of diagnosis of autism. And the way I now think of these things as passions and uh, tools for soothing an anxious mind and an anxious body, or for positioning a, a, a person in space and detecting where they are in relation to things. And that's all because of autistic people who have been able to articulate to me what their repetitive behaviors are for and what they feel like. And that's given me really kind of amazing insights into the people I work with who don't, aren't able to articulate it in quite the same way. Working with stakeholders in the community obviously minimizes risks to our research. So on a very practical level, you're going to get better recruitment and better engagement with the research, better quality data. Um, and that will see you through as well to when you're trying to implement research. Because of course, if you've created the research with the community, then they're going to hopefully want it when it's kind of finished and ready to turn into practice. Um, and increasingly, uh, funders are looking for what they call patient and public involvement, right? So there is a kind of, you know, the big oil tanker is slowly turning and recognizing that um, all these professors in their ivory towers don't necessarily know everything. And maybe we should be asking some people in the real world what they think. 
Um, I also think neurodiversity, specifically in relation to autism, fits with the latest evidence and theory that's really emerging. And I'm just going to briefly review a few examples of this. So the double empathy problem, for example, is a theoretical model developed by an autistic scholar, Dr. Damien Milton, that emphasizes that the social communication breakdown that's so often attributed to autistic people actually exists in the interaction between an autistic and a non-autistic person. And that's been really supported by an increasing body of evidence, including um, this finding from Noah Sasson, that uh, non-autistic people very rapidly judge autistic people, even based on thin slices of information, like a single photograph or a three second video clip. Um, and, and we neurotypical people judge autistic people more negatively on that, on that information. We also know from Morten and Gernsbacher's work that if you take a common measure of autism traits like the autism quotient, the AQ, and you adjust the language of the AQ um, to emphasize in-group or out-group status, you can adjust someone's apparent trait score. So in other words, on a version of the AQ that says, um, I think I can often understand what other autistic people are thinking, I would score with much higher autism traits because I'm not autistic and an autistic person would score with much lower autism traits compared to the original AQ item, which is just, I can understand what other people are thinking. So we've got these sort of normative biases, this neurotypical majority bias built into a lot of the measures that we've relied on. And that really exposes some of these assumptions that underpin our research. We also know that non-autistic people find judging the emotional expressions of autistic people quite challenging, even when they also rate those expressions to be equally intense. Um, and so again, this is an example of a case where for so long we have talked about autistic people as having a, an emotion recognition deficit, but we're actually starting to realize that that deficit goes both ways. And I'll just briefly say something about a new piece of research that um, myself and my colleague, uh, Catherine Crompton, are just about to publish. So what we've been looking at is how information is shared between people using a diffusion chain methodology. I haven't got time to go into the details, but essentially what this little graph shows is that the red and the green line, that's when you have a group of all autistic or all non-autistic people and, um, and you tell the first person a story and they have to try and remember the story and tell it to the next person, the next person, next person, and so on. And so obviously people forget the details, right? So that's why there's a downward slope. That's the number of details that they remember from person to person. But crucially, when you have a mixed group of people, when you're alternating between autistic and neurotypical people over the course of your chain, you get this much steeper, significantly steeper decline um, and the information is lost much more rapidly. And this is accompanied by lower ratings of rapport um, from the people involved in those interactions. Okay, so how do we go about embedding neurodiversity in our work, essentially what we need to do is work with neurodivergent people. We need to understand what their needs and priorities are and use that information to deliver meaningful research. And when I say meaningful, I think it should be useful to people, it should be respectful, and it should be kind. Okay, this is, I'm supposed to be under halfway, but I'm actually over halfway, so I'm going to go quick. Right. So there's lots of different types of participatory research that you can do. Often these are positioned in a ladder, a sort of hierarchy from less participatory to more participatory. But I've actually stopped using that metaphor because I think really it's about fitting the methodology to the question or the task ahead of you. But the basics are definitely the same, whatever method you choose. So there are some principles of engagement with stakeholders. You need to try and create a situation of trust and that's going to be based on mutual respect, a willingness to listen and to learn, to change if necessary in response to what that person is telling you. And these are associated with more practical considerations. You've got to think about building personal relationships over a longer period of time. So um, perhaps working with the same person um, over a series of projects. You're going to want to put proper investment planning, preparation, financial investment into the relationship. And as I say, you need to really be willing to change in response to what they're saying to you. But if you know that you can't change because there are fundamentals of RCT design, for example, that we can't violate, you need to be transparent and honest about those situations because otherwise you're not going to be able to maintain that trust. In terms of 
you know, moving participatory working onto a higher level. This is just a figure from a paper that we recently published. This was co-authored by autistic and non-autistic people from within and outside academia. Um, and some of the things that we're emphasizing here about things like infrastructure, the way that our universities um, are set up seems to be sometimes anathema to participatory working. You know, my university frequently, frequently wants me to pay my um, collaborators and advisors in gift vouchers, right? Now that's okay if you've just come in and done a WASI for half an hour for one of my PhD students as a puzzle, but if you are invested in this project and advising me and guiding me on how to deliver it properly, you should be paid a proper consultancy fee and not go home with an Amazon gift voucher in your pocket. <laughs> Thank you. Um, oh, it's nice, but it's hard to do, right? <laughs> Universities don't want us to do that. Um, Okay, so in terms of applying neurodiversity framework in the context of intervention, I'm just going to highlight a few ways I think we can do that. So right at the beginning, right, you're thinking about um, building basic science findings to underpin your intervention. You might be probing a particular kind of theoretical mechanism that you think is going to be important for your population. Um, you're going to be, want to be working out whether your intervention target actually fits with what your community requires. And then if you've identified some sort of um, research foundations for what you're doing, and you've got a kind of target in mind, you're going to be, want to be designing that intervention in partnership with people who will be end users of that intervention. Um, and so if that's, for example, an intervention for autistic children, obviously their partners will be, their parents will be partners in that research, but you might also want to be thinking about their, their siblings and their peers, and of course you want to be involving the children themselves. And that will take time and care and attention to get those resources right, to allow them to be effective contributors to what you're doing. So then you've, you've created your lovely co-designed intervention and you want to evaluate it, you're doing a little pilot RCT or maybe a nice big uh, fully powered RCT if you're very lucky. Um, you want to be thinking about what your outcome measures are going to be. So they should be associated with the original target that was developed from the work that you've done with stakeholders. But even the way that you measure that should ideally be co-created. There's a lovely example of this. Helen McConaughey and her colleagues did some work developing um, an extra module for the um, World Health Organization quality of life measure with autistic adults to capture quality of life domains that were relevant to them, for example. You're going to be wanting to work with people to consult on the specifics of the trial design, your information sheets, your consent forms, the number of appointments, whether you go out to people's homes or invite them into the lab and so on, and all of the materials that go with that. Um, and then when it comes to um, interpreting what you've done, what's fantastic if you can do it, is to bring in some citizen science at this level where you can share your results, share your data, anonymized of course, and invite people to process and interpret it and tell, tell you what they think of the patterns that you found in that information. And throughout all of that, you're going to want to make sure that you've got stakeholders in positions of power on your advisory board in a leadership role. And this image comes from a project that we did with a family, these two young men, uh, Stuart and Matthew, both have Fragile X syndrome and we did some work with them looking at trials for Fragile X syndrome and particularly working on outcome measures. Had an absolutely fascinating session with Stu and Matt's parents taking them through the various questionnaires that we often ask parents to complete in these kinds of RCTs and just having them talk to us about how it made them feel to be checking, checking off these tick boxes on these measures about their children's, you know, challenging behaviour or um, you know, functional capacities and so on. And that was very revealing. And at the dissemination and implementation phase, you want to make sure not just that you're feeding back to participants, but you're getting feedback from them. What was the experience like for them of participating in your research? And what can you learn from that for the future? And how can you integrate these supports into people's real lives in a way that is practical? And just generally as well, making sure that your dissemination methods are creative. It's so easy to sit down in front of your computer and record a quick video abstract, and that's going to reach more people than any number of PDFs, no matter how beautifully designed you've managed to make them. So the end result 
of this kind of participatory working, I believe, is that we'd grow a kind of community of empowered neurodivergent people who were informed about the true nuts and bolts of research. We'll end up with supports that people want and are able to use, and we can have this skilled community of collaborators for future research. But we want to make sure that in drawing all of this participatory working in, we don't throw the baby out with the bathwater. We want robust theory and powerful methods. We want to produce supports that are genuinely evidence-based. We want our research to be of the highest quality. And I think too many people think these are either or. Um, this is a, a choice between working with stakeholders or doing good science, and that's not true. In sum, I think it's all about building trusting relationships with our community. Neurodivergent people deserve the best awareness and understanding and support and services, but they also deserve the best theories and research questions and methods, measures and data. And together, that's the only way that we're going to deliver both of those things. That is where I will finish. I'd like to thank some of the many marvelous collaborators who contributed to the um, participatory work that I've been doing that informed this talk and our funders and all of you for listening and I wonder how you feel about the talk now you can vote <laughs> thank you thank you thank you very much Sue now we have uh, up to maximum 10 minutes for questions or comments or further contributions to the discussion can I see? I've got very bright lights shining on me here, so you have to make a, a lot of activity for me to see you. One over here. Yes, please. Thank you, Sue. That was a, a really interesting um, and thought-provoking presentation. Thanks. I'm wondering, though, whether you see um, neurotypical and neurodivergence as a dichotomy or as a continuum? <laughs> oh, what a lovely, easy question. <laughs> Honestly, I'm not sure. I'm really not sure. Um, so, so, so neurodiversity, you know, is, is diversity across the whole human race, right? I guess we can do a parallel with something like um, ethnic diversity. Um, you can sort of draw lines between ethnicities, but they're blurry lines, right? And people straddle um, those lines all of the time. And I would say probably it's the same when it comes to neurodiversity. Um, I think there's, there's a slight risk. So I, I don't believe you can dichotomize into neurotypical and neurodivergent. But if we, if we refuse to, to even suggest that there's a split, the risk is that we end up in a situation where we're just sort of milling around saying, well, everybody's different, and, and you just don't do anything to help people. Um, lots of the autistic people I work with get very angry with people saying, oh, we're all a little bit autistic. And they say, you know, one of my favorite metaphors is that if I had, say, swollen feet and a sore back and I hadn't slept very well last night, that doesn't make me pregnant, right? Even if. All of those things are similar experiences. So even though the dichotomy might not be real, I think we have to preserve it, um, at least at this stage in the conversation. Okay, thank you. More questions? There's, there's one here. Yeah, good. Uh, Sorry, it's very off. hard for us to see. You can shout if you want to. Yes. Thank you very much for this nice talk. I wonder whether in the autistic research community, the topic of participation, as we heard before, is at least a topic. And to my impression, it's a very low topic. It's not priority. And you are so in this field. Do you have any explanations for that? Um, that's a great question, and I think that the reason we don't succeed in talking about participation effectively in autism research is because of the disjunct between 
the type of participation that we assume all, say, children and young people should want, and the type of participation that autistic children and young people might want. And, and I'm not just talking about children and young people, but of course, particularly, you know, if you're still living at home with your parents, your participation choices are partly dictated by them. So we spend a lot of time sort of pushing autistic people into um, social spaces um, and, uh, and types of interactions that perhaps we think are good for them um, because they're more typical and perhaps not enough time listening to the kind of participation that they want and facilitating that. So a specific example would be around participating via technology, for example. I've done quite a lot of research in technology. I think technology is a really exciting way for lots of autistic people to participate on their own terms. And sometimes that can grow into other forms of participation. But because we've decided that technology is bad for you and screen time is, is poisonous, you know, as, or at least our media have in the UK, um, we don't respect that as a valid form of participation. And so there's a fundamental tension there between what the community might want and what our sort of well-meaning parents and practitioners are perhaps trying to, to, um, to create on their behalf, but, but without that information. Yes, there's a gentleman here. Will you tell me when we've run out of time? Can we do one more? This is really in uh, view of this particular question. I'd like to share our experience in Kolkata, India, where we use this inclusive model with goal-directed therapies. Just narrowing it a bit, given the topic was very big, very broad, both the keynote addresses. Um, we use these activities and we gently um, involve these children. Um, so we see their choices change with activity and participation in our framework, you know, the so-called normal framework, and it can be done. So that is one point, just the point that you have made that, you know, we need to still have the level or stigma at the moment in time, because otherwise all everything becomes absolutely um, bizarre. Really taking it from that line, I think one of the things that we need to um, understand is that if we guide them um, towards that broad framework, like for example, uh, there is a ICF core set on autism that does have activity and participation, again in that normalized zone, which can be utilized by professionals at the moment until we um, understand, because their choice and participation um, preferences do change and, and so-called normalizes over a period of time mm. that we have experienced there are few children after a while when you find that their choices are you know pro screen time we we do choose at, at a point in line um, as a cognitive behavior um, analysis part that yes we have tried enough this is who he is or she is he could do better with the gadgets and other things as his genuine, genuine choice, rather than thinking that he is autistic, so his choice is these, mm. right at the outset. Mm. Did, does, does it make sense? Yes, it does. And, and I think, yes. so what's coming across very clearly, which I very strongly agree with, is that these aren't conversations that you have once, and then you've had the conversation and you have the information. It's about ongoing relationships, and whether that's between um, practitioners and the client group that they work with, or for me as a researcher with the stakeholder communities that I work with, with third sector organizations and so on, you know, we can't presume that because we've had a conversation and we've established something that's useful and enjoyable and helpful at this time, that that will be retained. Um, and so the, it, it is all about building relationships and, and getting into it for the long haul, especially when it comes to research, because of course research takes a little while before you get anything useful out of it. Thank you. Time for one more question. Let's see any more. 
Just a, a little comment that my, from myself, if mm -hmm. you don't mind, on, on, I think it's very interesting to see it as part of the equality agenda, neurodiversity is part of the equality agenda, agenda. but I, you, you picked up right at the beginning on sexism as an example, you know, uh, something to be, that, that is not affecting uh, research. Um, but I, I think when, you, when we're talking about it from the perspective of um, children with disabilities, um, maybe sort of ethnic differences is a, 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 um, a closer uh, anomaly, a, a, a analogy, in the, in the sense of it's always a minority. Um, and, and one of the issues that we have when we're trying to talk and to take up an equality perspective is that we're often always asking for exceptions to be made. Mm. So we're not like everybody else. We're not, we don't want to be treated in exactly the same way. Yes, mm. we want to have the same access or the same mm. rights, but we know that we can't do it in the same way. Mm. So it's, 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 a, it's always a minority position. And, and there you did hint at it in some of your um, later slides was the idea that there are other stakeholder groups that you should be um, bringing in there, such as peer groups. And, and, and so it's not just children with disabilities, not even just their families who have mm. first-hand experience. It's, it's the ones that they, that they come across in school. Mm. Mm. And because in the end, actually, the participation and so forth at, at a childhood level mm. is the interaction with other children, the neurotypical mm. children, as it were. And it would be interesting to see them more, more and more involved too. Yeah. Yeah, I completely agree. And actually, on the first point you raised, you know, when you're trying to draw these kind of metaphorical comparisons with other groups, you do always, it's a very risky business because you can dig yourself into a hole where your metaphor doesn't work anymore and suddenly you've offended someone. Um, so that is definitely very risky. Um, but I do think for a long time, ableism and prejudice against people with disabilities has not been ranked as one of our equality and diversity issues on the same level as racism, sexism, homophobia, and so on. And, and, and it, should, it should be up there. It needs to be as much of a priority. Um, and yet it's still forgotten about in the kind of um, array of equality and diversity issues that as a, you know, a, as a global community, we're all trying to get sort of better at. Um, and so I think, Sometimes those metaphors can be very useful to sort of highlight where people have prejudices that they've maybe not even really examined before or recognized as prejudices. Um, so, so the metaphors can be useful, but yeah, they're, they're, they're a dangerous tool. <laughs> okay, thank you. Thank you. And thank you everybody Thanks for the everyone. session.